start so I don't forget that. And all right, welcome. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first in a four-part series from Maine Audubon exploring the potential benefits of floating offshore wind energy in the Gulf of Maine, as well as its potential environmental impacts. Uh, today, for our first presentation titled Offshore Wind in the Gulf of Maine, a Primer, we are honored to be joined by Dr. Habib Dagher, the founding executive director of the Advancement Structures and Composite, Composite Center at the University of Maine. Um, before I introduce Dr. Dogger, which I will do, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about why Maine Audubon is hosting this series starting now. Um, more than a century of burning fossil fuels has altered the chemical composition of our atmosphere, uh, changing the climate we are accustomed to and throwing the natural world out of balance. Uh, Mainers are seeing these changes firsthand, as evidenced by scientifically measured three degrees warming trend in the state since 1895, a growing season which has lengthened by about 16 days since 1950, and a Gulf of Maine that is warming faster than almost any other water body on Earth. Um, these changes are impacting our wildlife. Uh, moose populations are falling as the warmer winters are permitting the advancement of deadly ticks, Traditionally, southern species are showing up in the Maine woods and waters, including the Carolina wren, the black sea bass, lined seahorse, and the red-bellied woodpecker. Um, modeling reports from the National Audubon Society predict that if the current rate of warming continues, more than 106 of Maine's bird species will lose habitat in the state by 2050, and some, like our iconic common loon, will be pushed out of their breeding range entirely. Uh, we need to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels or else Maine will no longer be Maine. Uh, at the top of the list of ways to achieve this is to convert, convert to electric energy powered by renewable sources. Maine Audubon is a longtime supporter of renewable energy uh, dating to at least the 1970s when our Falmouth headquarters was built with passive solar and radiant heat uh, up until our current work supporting appropriately sited solar and terrestrial wind projects. Um, the potential for offshore wind energy in the Gulf of Maine, uh, especially floating offshore wind, is far greater than any other source, with an estimated 156 gigawatts of energy available for conversion. Uh, to put that number in perspective, that is more than 70 times the amount of electricity used by the entire state of Maine in an entire year. Um, the opportunity to produce such a large amount of clean, renewable energy locally cannot be ignored and deserves full study. Um, we understand that the build out of floating offshore wind, still an experimental technology, uh, would have impacts both on the environmental resources and the human uses of the ocean. But we owe it to ourselves and to future Mainers to make every effort to meet our climate goals. So that's why we're launching this series, beginning today with Dr. Dogger. Um, we will be hosting uh, three more sessions on consecutive Tuesdays. I just want to run through those very quickly. Um, the next is at 11 a.m., not noon, uh, and we'll be hosting Wing Goodell from the Maine based Biodiversity Research Institute uh, and Oregon State researcher Roberto Albertani to discuss the potential impacts of offshore wind on bird populations in the Gulf. Um, on Tuesday, April 6 at 12.30, uh, we'll be uh, hosting a bat researcher, Trevor Peterson from Stantec, as well as some researchers on marine mammals to discuss the offshore wind in the marine environment. And finally, on April 13th at noon, we'll be hosting uh, Cecilia Cunningham, the deputy director of the governor's energy office to discuss the latest de developments in the Gulf of Maine. Um, all right, and again, uh, before I introduce Dr. Docker, just a little technical update. So we are in the webinar format today, which means that um, we cannot hear or see the attendees on. Um, you can type in the chat, which comes to us, but if you uh, have questions for the end of the program, um, please put them in the Q&A box, which you can find along the lower screen. Um, I will be bringing my colleague, Eliza Donahue, uh, Maine Audubon's Director of Advocacy, back for that portion of the program, um, in case you have questions about Maine Audubon's work or anything like that. So, uh, and we are recording. Uh, this will be available if you have to leave or miss part of it uh, on Maine Audubon's website um, uh, very soon. Okay, so um, today uh, we're getting started and we are honored to be joined by Dr. Habib Dogher. 
Um, before I lead, uh, read a list of titles, I think it can be summarized like this. When, when we're talking about who is doing the work to make Maine a center of innovation, uh, who is putting Maine on the map, not just as a place to visit for the weekend or vacation, um, but as a place of technological innovation and cutting edge thinking, you know, we're talking about Dr. Dogger. He is the founding executive director of the University of Maine's Advanced Structures and Composite Center, a massive laboratory dedicated to discovering infrastructure solutions, such as more durable roads and bridges, carbon fiber vessels, and of particular interest today, floating offshore wind turbines. Um, he is uh, the, uh, a 2015 White House Transportation Champion of Change, the Carnegie Foundation Maine Professor of the Year, uh, and the Maine International Trade Center Innovator of the Year, among many other accolades. Um, please welcome Dr. Habib Dogger. Thank you, Nick. It's a great, great pleasure to be with you. And, and uh, I'm the engineer in the group, so I'm going to focus a lot of my presentation today about the engineering aspects of floating wind. And you'll be, uh, the, the, the subsequent presentations will talk about the environmental ecological aspects of it. So, so this is engineering 101 of floating offshore wind, if you wish, is what I'd like to talk about today. Uh, so um, I have a presentation to, to share, so. Can you see my screen, all right? Yes, sir. Excellent. Um, so what is floating offshore winds? And what is New England Aquaventus one? Uh, a floating wind turbine is a turbine that doesn't, is not fixed to the seabed. If you have deeper waters like we have off the Gulf of Maine, you cannot take turbines directly to the seabed. It gets to be too expensive to do so. So a floating turbine, it's almost like think of a ship that's floating but have, have a tower on it with a turbine supported on it. Uh, in our case, we're using this design that we, we have developed for the, for the state of Maine. Uh, it's a, called a semi-submersible design. It has um, three floating columns, one, two, and three flotation columns on each corner and one in the center. And they're tied under the water with three beams. Uh, uh, now to give you a sense of scale, this is not small. Uh, uh, I've, there's a, uh, school bus sitting right here to give you a sense of scale of this particular design. Now, since this unit actually floats, um, it needs to be more to the seabound. So it has mooring lines attached to it. Um, in our case, we're using three mooring lines, one, two, and three. They could be made out of steel chain or synthetic mooring systems. And then how does the power come back to shore? Uh, in this case, it comes back with an undersea cable. Um, the cable comes down from the turbine, down the tower, down the side of the hull and comes up from the bottom of the hull and makes an S shape uh, and, and then eventually is fixed to the seabed and, and bury it, whatever you can, we can bury it. Uh, now there's buoyancy modules uh, on the flotation uh, electric cable to allow it to follow the hull because the hull is not gonna stay in one place. Uh, it is moored like a ship would be moored. As, as the wind changes direction and the wave changes direction, the hull will also move around a little bit. And, and it's important for the electrical cable to follow the hull. And that's why we have a dynamic portion of the cable. But the majority of the cable is fixed and, 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 and under, under the sea, uh, buried under the sea where, where you can bury it. Now, this design is called a semi-submersible. Uh, the work has been funded uh, by the US Department of Energy uh, right now for over a decade uh, and uh, under a program called the Advanced Technology Demonstration Program for Offshore Wind. Uh, this particular design, the university has over 60 patents on. It can be made locally. It has been approved by the American Bureau of Shipping um, uh, for a six megawatt hull that we've designed. Uh, it's been offshore tested. And according to the National Renewable Energy Lab, if we can scale up the technology where we're actually making a lot of these units uh, for, for larger projects, the, the price can go down below six cents a kilowatt hour, including the, in, uh, the interconnect to shore. Um, so, well, I'll talk about a little bit about the center where I work, uh, a, a bit more about floating turbines. Why, why in Maine? What do they look like? Uh, what are the different designs out there? Uh, then I'll talk about the research in floating turbines that we've done since 2008, why we got started. And then the next step for us is New England Aquaventus One, a single turbine uh, to be placed off Monhegan Island by 2023. And I'll open it up to questions. So this is the research lab where I work at the University of Maine in the Orono campus. Uh, we're the largest 
university-based research center in the state of Maine. And uh, we are 25 years old as a center. Uh, we have 260 people who work in the lab, faculty, staff, and students. Um, and we've had over 2,500 students from over 35 uh, majors on campus come and work in this laboratory. Um, the students can work up to 30 hours a week during the academic year and full-time in the summer and the breaks. Um, we've had over 10 companies that spun off our lab using uh, from technology developed in this laboratory, over 25,000 visitors to the lab. Um, and, and these are our partners and clients from across the globe. So these are companies or research institutes uh, that work with us on developing new materials. Now our strategic plan was, was updated in 2020 and it's called GEM for green energy and materials. So uh, our goal here is to make contributions to the world in developing green materials and green energy. And that's where we're heading as an organization. Uh, to give you a sense of uh, some of the facilities inside the lab. This is an example of a wind blade test in our laboratory in Orono. Uh, this is a 165 foot wind blade being tested to simulate uh, the effects of 20 years of life uh, on the turbine. And you can see um, this is a, this turbine, this blade is as long as 16 stories uh, uh, being tested as you see uh, uh, in the lab to certify it. So we know it could be, it can sustain the environment offshore. We do this work with, uh, with um, OEMs. These are the, uh, uh, the manufacturers uh, of wind turbines. Another facility we've added at the university uh, is, is called the W square wave wind basin, the Alphon W square wave wind basin, um, thanks to support from the Alphon foundation. Uh, and what's unique about this facility, it can recreate both a wind storm and a wave storm. There are wave um, basins across the country. There are wind tunnels across the country, but we're the first to put the two together to be able to recreate um, storms that are important to validate designs of, of offshore wind turbines and, 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 and ships and so forth. Uh, you can see here, uh, there's a floating turbine sitting in front of the open jet wind tunnel. Uh, and that's a 150 scale version of a larger unit. And we test that in the laboratory as we develop new technologies. Uh, this is what, uh, what the wave wind basin looks like to give you a sense of how we validate new technologies. Uh, these are examples of waves being produced um, in the laboratory. Waves can come from different directions. And, uh, and, and this is the open jet wind tunnel that allows us to also create wind storms. And we can change wind speed with height, very much like what occurs offshore. Um, uh, we can uh, change wind directions. We can change wave directions. Um, and uh, and we also test wind turbines um, in, in, this, in this laboratory, floating wind turbines. Uh, and here's an example of a floating wind turbine in a 50 year storm. Um, uh, and you can see how we can validate if you wish the designs using a facility like that. Now, are we the only ones thinking of offshore wind? Uh, not at all. Actually, Europe built its first offshore wind farm in 1991. They have over 5,000 turbines. In the US, uh, uh, the same thing is happening. There's a, there's a if you wish, a, a major move uh, to help power uh, coastal cities and coastal states using offshore wind. Uh, the size of these orange um, circles uh, is the size of the farm that's being proposed. There's a whole bunch of them out there. And notice in Maine, there's New England Aquaventus One, which is our single turbine project, which will be uh, an 11 megawatt turbine. Uh, the, um, What's unique about Maine and many other parts of the country, particularly the West Coast, is we have deep waters off of our coast. What's been built in Europe since 1991, the projects you see um, uh, south of us here on the, on, the West, on the East Coast are all today fixed bottom turbines. Uh, but in Maine, we have deep waters and therefore we cannot use fixed bottom turbines. If you're about three nautical miles off the coast of Maine, you're in about 300 feet of water. So it's not feasible to use fixed bottom turbines, at least cost effective to do so. And uh, what you see here in dark blue and in light blue are the, the areas where you have deep waters in dark blue and light in, in, in shallower waters in light blue. And you can see here the light blue areas um, in Southern New England, as well as the mid-Atlantic states where all these projects are fixed bottom projects are being proposed. Uh, in Maine, we have no choice but to go to floating because we have deep waters. If you look at the West Coast, it's the same situation. They have only deep waters. Uh, so about 60% of the US offshore wind resource 
could be harnessed using floating technology. So floating technology is a very important part, not only to the US, but also throughout the world. And uh, now looking at the state of Maine, we ran some numbers a number of years ago, um, back in 2009 and 10, if you recall, when energy prices, uh, oil prices went up to $4 a gallon. Maine was, was, was in a crisis because families in Maine were, uh, were, were, were uh, at the time, anticipated to spend about $10,000 per year on, on energy costs per family. And, and that's $5,000 per year in gasoline, $4,000 per year in heating oil, and $1,000 per year in electricity. And that represents uh, a, a, a close to 20% of the average family income in the state of Maine. So we were in a crisis mode and we're trying to find ways to reduce costs to, to Maine families. We looked at all, all kinds of renewable opportunities in the state of Maine. Uh, we looked at solar, uh, which is important. We looked at uh, uh, more uh, hydro dams in the state. We looked at uh, uh, wave energy, tidal energy, and uh, land-based wind, offshore wind. And we came to the conclusion that all of them are important, but the, 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 the big opportunity in the state of Maine is offshore wind because we have so much of it, we can scale to electrify heating and transportation. To put that in perspective, we estimated back in 2009 that if we only harness 3% of the offshore wind resource in the Gulf of Maine, we can heat every home and drive every car. And that's the impetus uh, for us to move forward and help clean up the environment, if you wish, and, and, and hopefully create lots of jobs at the same time. Of course, this comes with a, with a big environmental responsibility, as well as responsibility to, to the other users of the ocean, including the fishing industry in our state. So to, for, for any plan like that to move forward, it, it needs to, uh, to, to take into account all, all the important constituencies. Uh, another number I'd like to, to put, put out there that based on EIA, the Energy Information Administration numbers, the state of Maine has been spending over the last many years between 3.6 and $5.8 billion in fossil fuels. And these are fossil fuels that are putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So, so essentially, we're burning about three to six billion dollars worth of fossil fuels, and, and the CO2 and, and the greenhouse gases are going in the air. Uh, if we can electrify heating and transportation in our state using resources such as offshore wind and other renewables, we can make a, a big dent in, into, into those numbers. And plus, at the same time, we can keep a lot of these dollars in the state of Maine and help create jobs in Maine as well in the meantime. Uh, so what do floating turbines look like uh, from an engineering perspective? Uh, ironically enough, floating turbine designs are derived from oil and gas floating rigs. And, and there are three different types of um, floating, uh, oil and uh, floating oil and gas rigs and floating uh, wind turbine types. One is called a spar buoy. The second is called a semi-submersible. A, a semi, a a, a semi and the third one is called the tension leg platform. A spar buoy, uh, it is like a big tube, floating tube, with a mass at the very bottom. Uh, these tubes in the real world could be 300 feet long under the water, could be 20 plus feet in diameter. Uh, they're full of air, except at the very bottom of the tube, there's, there's a ballast or a mass. Uh, as if you, you were to take a, a, um, a, a water bottle and, and empty it out and then put some sand at the bottom of it and, and place it in a bathtub that water bottle will stand up. And the more sand you, you put in, the more it goes down, but it'll stand up to, to a certain point. And that's what a spar is. And, and to keep it on station, it's got three mooring lines on it. Uh, so the disadvantage, it needs a very deep draft, 300 feet plus a draft. The semi-submersible uh, is very similar, um, uh, except it's got a much shallower draft. Uh, it also needs three mooring lines, just like this one does, uh, uh, the, the, like the spar does. Uh, but in this case, you have uh, smaller flotation columns or, 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 or flotation bodies. Uh, if you think of a, if a catamaran, if you've sailed a catamaran, the catamaran has two hulls. And how do you make a can catamaran more stable? Uh, you can make the hull bigger and you have a more stable catamaran, or you can uh, put the hulls farther apart, you have a more stable catamaran. Where in our case, this is a trimaran. We have one, two, three hulls and the tower support in the center. Uh, so this is a trimaran, uh, but if you put a trimaran out or, or catamaran out in the middle of the ocean, it's gonna float away. So you need to keep it on station. That's why you have three mooring lines. And finally, the last design is called the tension leg platform. 
what it is, you have a buoyancy, buoyancy body under the water full of air that wants to pop out of the water. And then what keeps it from popping out of the water is you have tension legs to the seabed uh, that anchor it down and, and, and give it that overturning moment capacity. So th these are the three designs. We looked at all of them and, and tried to identify what works best in the, in the Gulf of Maine. And what works best is a semi-submersible because the spar has a 300 foot draft and you can't fabricate a dockside in the Gulf of Maine and tow it out to sea. Um, so there are though a lot of different designs of floating turbines. As far as I know today, there's more than 40 out there, out there today. Uh, when we started back in 2008, there was a couple, us and a couple others. Um, and um, in our design, it's called Volturnus. You can see it right here. So there's a lot of different ways if you wish to float in wind turbines. And there's an international race to develop these different technologies. And, 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 and there are major programs being developed in, in Europe and in Southeast Asia to put floating farms out there right now. France has a, a bid request uh, 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 right now, Scotland for floating farms as well, as well as in Southeast Asia. So there's a big race right now because it's a, uh, there's a major opportunity globally. And we're part of that race in the state of Maine. And, and, and we're, we're built, we, we built this Volturnus technology. Uh, back in 2013, uh, we, we designed and built under a DOE grant, the first floater uh, uh, that, that we built in our laboratory and deployed off Castine, Maine. It was a one to eight scale version of a bigger unit. Uh, and notice that we, we used square uh, flotation columns versus round because it was cheaper to do it that way at the time. And, and it was an exciting day for Maine. We had over uh, 1,500 people come, come to visit, uh, visit us when we launched that hall. Uh, and, um, and it was fabricated at UMaine in pieces and assembled in Brewer. Uh, uh, we, we shipped it from UMaine to Brewer on three flatbed trucks, assembled it there and launched it from Brewer. And, um, and we put it into the Penobscot River and towed it out to sea using a main maritime tugboat. And uh, it was about a 10 hour tug. Uh, and, and then when, we, when it got to Castine, we had pre-installed three mooring lines that were buoyed. And we had an undersea cable that was pre-installed. Uh, and and, um, and when, when it got there, we hooked up the three mooring lines to each one of the three flotation columns. And we hooked up the undersea cable to, to the turbine. And we also had about 60 sensors on board the goal of the, 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 the project was not to generate a lot of electricity, it was to actually see if we can predict the motions of the hull uh, in that environment. Can we really predict what happens to, to a floating hull under winds and waves and currents and so on and so forth? That was the purpose of the experiment. It's not really an energy generation experiment. And uh, so this is what it looked like off Castine in 2013. And on June 2013, we, the state of Maine made history uh, because we were able to connect that to shore. And, uh, and this became the first time that an offshore wind electron flew into the US grid. Notice uh, near the site, uh, we have also uh, a floating uh, LIDAR there that actually measures wind speeds at hub height and measures waves and winds uh, at that location and currents. Um, you see the white, the white uh, buoys here, that's where the mooring anchors were. So there's mooring lines to the mooring anchors, um, just like you would have on a boat. And the undersea cable goes down to, uh, to uh, someone's house in Castine here uh, that's worked with us. Um, this is an example of, of the very first storm we saw. Uh, it was in December, 2013. It was called Winter Storm Electra. Uh, what's, what's blowing across here is actually snow. Um, and if you look at the white caps in that picture, uh, you could see the size of the wave relative to the size of the hull. The very big waves relative to the size of the hull because it was one to eight scale version of the full size unit. So it saw big waves very, in a very short time. Uh, and you could see here, um, the waves that it saw, the 50 year waves, uh, don't even move it. You can't even see the motions of the hull in a 50 year wave. And that's really what we tried to design is something that is very stable offshore. What we found is that in a 500 year storm, it moved off vertical less than seven degrees. So that was a good validation of the technology that we know what we're doing in essence. And, and, uh, Needless to say, uh, that was an exciting moment for the entire research team that worked on this project. Uh, and this is some of the data we collected, but I wanted to show you a shot here of, of a wave. Uh, and notice how big the wave is. The wave actually submerged completely one of the flotation columns. Uh, this happens to be close to a 500 year wave. And in the Gulf of Maine, a 500 year wave from peak to trough is roughly 70 feet, long, 70 feet high. 
so, so imagine what this unit is seeing in that in that environment. Uh, but in that environment, uh, uh, in, during that year and a half that we put it out there, um, we we saw forty storms between a fifty year and a five hundred year return period. And in all storms, the maximum heel angle of vertical was less than less than seven degrees, and the maximum acceleration at the at the nacelle level was two tenths of a g. And what you see in red and blue is our predictive models and, and the data we collected for acceleration of the hull. And notice that we're able to predict very closely how much acceleration the hull saw. And that's really what, we, what was the purpose of this whole experiment. It was, we're not going out there and, and have uh, generate a lot of electricity. We're just trying to, this was a test to see if we can, we can uh, uh, evaluate the motions of the hull accurately. So what's next? Uh, the, the next step of the project is to go bigger and, and uh, it's kind of crawl before you walk, walk before you run. And, and, uh, uh, and the main legislature uh, has um, uh, over the many years uh, created a test site uh, off the coast of um, uh, the coast of Monhegan Island. There, was, uh, there were three sites that were created through the Maine legislature and, and one of them was assigned to the University of Maine to, to, do, to do some testing of next generation technologies. Uh, and um, in this case, uh, we are placing a single turbine, that's the goal, off Monhegan Island, two and a half miles south of that, uh, and using this Volturnus concrete hull design. We were joined by two companies, uh, RWE and the Mitsubishi Corporation, through its Diamond Generating Corporation, that are invested in this, in this uh, project. Uh, and they formed uh, a company called New England Aquaventus to, to build the hull and, and, and help us test it. The U.S. Yes, Department of Energy is also involved very heavily in this, and of course, the state of Maine uh, uh, has has enabled all of this through legislation that has been passed over the last decade. Uh, the, the the site is off Monhegan Island. If you're in Maine, uh, Monhegan Island is right here. Uh, you can see where that is um, off the coast of Maine. Um, the, um, the this is what the site uh, geotech physical location uh, physical conditions look like. About 300 feet of water at the site where the turbine will go. The blue line you see here is, is three nautical miles off Monhegan. That's a de demarcation line between state waters and federal waters. So the hull would float in this pink area, which was designated for us by the state of Maine. Uh, and the hull is made out of uh, uh, five major components. Uh, one, one, one piece, uh, one is called the central column. There are three radial columns, number two, one, two, and three flotation columns. There are uh, three is, is radial beams, one, two, and three uh, under the water. And finally, uh, uh, five are, are ties that tie the top of the columns together. There's steel, four foot di diameter uh, pipes that tie all four uh, flotation columns together. Uh, the hull is built like a bridge upside down. And what we wanted to do is, is have the ability to fabricate the hull locally so that we can create local jobs. And, and what we did is borrowed from the bridge construction industry, a technology called segmental concrete construction. These are bridges built by making Legos of concrete, if you wish, uh, that are stacked together in post tensions uh, to form a bridge. What you see in the upper left-hand corner is what a bridge might look like where you have four piers in the water and the bridge um, superstructure connecting the piers. So traffic would be running on top of those. If you take that and flip it upside down, you get our hull. So our hull is like a bridge, except it's, it's built upside down. Uh, and you can see here the components of the hull. This is an example of a similar bridge technology that's used to build uh, the Sierra Long Bridge between Maine and, and, and New Hampshire. It was uh, and it was it was built using these blocks of concrete that were fabricated near the near the the site, uh, and some of them were actually fabricated and brought in uh, from uh, from a farther distance, and they were stacked together as you see using a crane, and then post tension vertically squeezed together if you wish to fit, to form a monolithic section. It's the same construction technology we'll be using to build the hull, except we'll be building it dockside and then putting it into the water afterwards. Uh, one potential location we've been looking at to, to build it is in Brewer, Maine. Uh, uh, the other is in Searsport, Maine. Uh, uh, and um, now, how do you anchor it to the seabed? Uh, there are a lot of different ways you can anchor it, and most of the anchor technology is borrowed from the oil and gas industry. In our case, we're looking at two different systems right now. We're looking at a steel chain system with a drag anchor like that, 
and we're also potentially looking at a synthetic mooring system that would have a smaller footprint on the seabed. Um, the, uh, the, let's talk about the steel chain system. What you see in dark black are the mooring lines. So there's one, two, three mooring lines. And then they, they are connected to an anchor on the seabed. The anchor that we plan to use with a steel chain is, is, is called a drag anchor. It's been used for decades in the oil and gas industry and other applications. It looks like, it looks like that. And it looks like a plow, if you wish. And you drag that along the seabed in the mud. And as you drag it, it embeds itself because of the plow shape at the end of the, at, at the, end of the drag anchor. Um, and when you have enough depth, you have enough pull capacity uh, to, to hold the turbine uh, together. So we have three of these uh, mooring anchors uh, at the locations shown in, 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 uh, in, uh, in brown right here. And the, 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 the turbine itself is shown in green. That's where the turbine is. And we have three black lines here these are the three mooring lines. The white lines are temporary anchors to help us set the others. Uh, so now the beauty of these is they don't make noise when you put them in. And then uh, the, the hull that we've designed, we've designed it for a hundred year life. Uh, and we'll talk, we can talk more about that later, which reduces the environmental footprint of the technology significantly. Uh, typical offshore wind farms today made out of steel have about a 25 year life uh, where the turbine would have to be replaced or the steel may have to be replaced. Uh, we've designed our, our turbine for 100 year life or hull for 100 year life, not the turbine, so that every 25 years you can actually tow the hull back to shore, put a new turbine on and send it back out. So, so, so the environmental footprint, if you wish, uh, is significantly reduced in the long run and the costs are reduced. So that's how we hook it up to the seabed. The, the other very important part of this experiment is not just an engineering experiment, it's also an environmental experiment. Uh, and what I say environmental studies are so critical for us to understand how we do future developments. So the purpose of this, uh, this environmental studies here is to evaluate using the single turbine, the effect of a floating turbine on its environment, including the birds, the bats, as well as people who use the environment around it, working with the fisheries and so forth. Uh, so it's an experiment. And when you do an experiment, you try to keep it small, crawl before you walk, walk before you run, so you don't make mistakes at a large scale. Uh, so this is an opportunity for all of us to learn, not only on the, on the technology side, but also on the environmental side. So we've had a number uh, of, of uh, experts in the environmental side, um, bird biologists, fish biologists, marine mammal biologists, and others um, uh, to, uh, that have uh, been collecting data at that site of Monhegan Island that was designated by the state. We've collected benthos data, fish data, marine mammal data, bird data, bat data, noise and vibration data, uh, electromagnetic fields, geophysical data, terrestrial data, and we've done some vis also aesthetics and visual uh, um, uh, surveys to see what, what it would look like uh, from different, different locations on the coast, as well as cultural and historic studies. These are baseline studies to understand uh, what, what the current condition of that environment is. And when we come in and bring the single turbine in there and hook it up to the seabed, we're gonna continue to do studies like that to be able to compare, if you wish, uh, the before and after and be better understand the impact uh, of this turbine on its environment. And that's a big part of what we're trying to understand as we move forward. Uh, and another major concern we have and we'd like to understand better is how the cables, um, uh, the mooring lines and anchors interact with the fisheries. And, and we look forward to work with, with, with the fish, fishing industry to, to do some case, case evaluations of how close can you fish to this and, and what impact it would have uh, on, on the fishing industry. Uh, now, in terms of the engineering side, I promised you engineering uh, uh, work. We, 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 uh, when we design one of these hulls, we, we use a lot of engineering tools. That's an example uh, of some of our numerical models uh, showing a 50 year return period wave uh, and, and, and some magnified motions of the hull, so you can see what it would look like under a wave. And in the bottom, you can see the stresses that the hull sees as it moves, uh, as the waves move through it, if you wish. Uh, and, and these are the color codes of the actual stresses it sees. And that's how, these are the kinds of tools we use to design it. And typically when we design a hull like that, we run up to 80,000 different load cases. Uh, these are different winds and wave combinations and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and um, as well as uh, currents and, and, and ice loading and snow loading and, and so on and so forth. Those are uh, the kinds of conditions we design a hull like that for. Uh, and finally, um, uh, it, this is a bit more about the mooring line, the, the, uh, the, the electric cable. 
the electric cable, as I said, will come down from the turbine, down the tower, uh, and down the side of the hull through a J tube. Um, and then it, it comes vertically down the J tube up through some buoyancy modules. And, and then um, there's a friction clamp and an anchor at the seabed that fixes that. And from there on, the, the cable, um, the goal is to try to bury the cable to the extent that you can. And that's why there's an offshore survey taking place right now, is to try to figure out uh, which, where, where, where and how much we can bury the cable uh, to try to minimize impact on the environment and, and the fisheries. Uh, the, uh, uh, now, I'd like to say that I, I'm not going to go all, all over, over this, but this didn't start overnight. This whole effort uh, had, had origins back in 20, 2006, 2007 with Ocean Energy Institute. Um, and in 2008, a governor, governor's Ocean Energy Task Force was put together that I happened to serve on, a bipartisan task force. They passed a number of pieces of legislation. To, to move this whole effort forward. So, so, this, the, so the University of Maine is really working to, uh, to um, uh, uh, under this particular construct that the state has put together and supporting the state to help us get there uh, uh, as efficiently as possible. Uh, uh, as the governors, if you need to know what's next, the governor's energy office is, is doing, um, has a website that has a lot more data uh, about what the, the state plans are as they move forward. There's, there's quite answers to a lot of uh, uh, frequently asked questions as well. So uh, I invite you to go to the um, uh, Governor's Energy Office Offshore Wind website to dig into more of the details of where the state would like to go. Uh, but we all know the state has uh, established some, uh, the Climate Council, some, some very aggressive goals. And an offshore wind is a, is a part of that, is a part of helping us get where we need to be at, at scale, particularly electrifying heating and transportation. Um, and, um, but also offshore wind is, is, is part of the economic development strategy for the state of Maine. And, and we, we at the university are helping the state help implement that particular strategy. And the strategy, um, this is, this is a, 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 the main economic development strategy report. And you, you're welcome to go look at that. And you can see that the state would like to use offshore wind as, 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 uh, as an opportunity to create jobs as well. In terms of where the state is going, uh, in 2013, I showed you we put uh, the one to eight scale off, uh, off Castine. In 2023, our goal is to have the single turbine and learn as much as we can from that. The state's also been planning a, a, a research array to also help us learn more before we go to, to anything bigger. And, and uh, it's kind of a crawl before you walk, walk before you run approach. Uh, in, in, in the first turbine in 2023 will give us a lot to learn from. And the next logical step was to put maybe 10 to 12 turbines in the Gulf of Maine and really <clears> study them and, and, and evaluate the, the impacts on the environment and the fisheries and so forth by all working together and hopefully find solutions that we can all agree on or, uh, or find problems that we want to try to avoid. Uh, so so by, by having this very uh, deliberate and careful approach and collecting data as we go, we minimize impact on the environment and the fisheries and, and other uses of the ocean. Uh, now, I'd like to premise that by saying that nothing that we do as a society, as, as humans on Earth, are, have a zero impact on the environment. We will have an impact. And the goal of this uh, deliberate approach is to help minimize that impact and maximize benefit to society, both uh, environmental benefits, um, uh, global change benefits, as well as, as, uh, as um, uh, 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 job, jobs and economic development benefits. So, and this is where I'd end. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Dr. Dogger, thank you so very much. Um, there is a lot going on. Thank you for being in the middle of it. Um, I want to uh, open things up for questions now. Please, if you could put them in the Q&A box, uh, not in the chat. It's much easier to keep track of them there. Um, and I'd like to get started. Maybe if I could ask uh, a quick clarification. There's a number of questions uh, in the chat and in the news now about uh, what's going on around Monhegan. Um, just to clarify, so there's one test turbine um, scheduled to go in uh, a few miles off Monhegan, and then the next step would be a 12 uh, turbine array. Where would that go? Is that near, uh, near Monhegan as well? Or we're still looking for a site, is that correct? Uh, the state's still looking for a site and in, in, in really engaging with different constituencies um, and users of the ocean to identify the site that makes sense to people. So, so the state is engaged in that right now is having a number of seminars uh, and, and collecting data and information for that. We don't know where that site's gonna go yet. So. 
Okay, so just so I don't know it's going to go this way. So. Someone might, <laughs> right? Um, there are some a, a few questions about. Um, you mentioned a three percent wind capture um, number. Actually, and I'd like to bring my colleague Eliza Donahue back on if she if or we, if she can. Sorry, I forgot that. She's our director of advocacy. Um, she's on just in case there are questions uh, for Maine Audubon's work. Um, Dr. Dogger, you mentioned a a. Um, you know, trying to capture 3% of the uh, wind energy. Could you talk about uh, sort of spatially what capturing 3% might look like? Very good question, Nick. So um, the numbers, again, uh, I'm not advocating that we should capture 3% of the Gulf of Maine energy. I just, I think this was an exercise we, we asked ourselves is how much of the Gulf of Maine offshore wind resource do we need to actually harness in order to electrify heating and transportation in the state of Maine. If we want to use electric cars, all of us by 2050 would have electric cars. Let's assume that. If all of us are going to use electric heat pumps to heat our homes, uh, how much electricity do we need? And if, if, we're ch if we chose to do that using offshore wind, what would we would do? So I'm not advocating to do 3% of the Gulf of Maine. I'm just, this was more of a hypothetical exercise, Nick, to try sure. to figure out how much do we need? So what we found that is if we harness 3%, of the offshore wind resource in the Gulf of Maine. What that means is, is 3% of the area within 50 miles of the, the Gulf of Maine. So 50 miles of the coast, which 3% do we need, do we wanna use? So that, that's what we would need. We would need 3% of the surface area of the Gulf of Maine to heat every home and drive every car. Okay, that's, that's what we would need. And the question really is for all of us is first, do we wanna do that or not? Okay, uh, and, two, uh, and two, if we're gonna do it, where do we do it? And, and that's really some of the important uh, environmental, ecological, and fisheries question that we all have to ask ourselves, to roll up our sleeve, work together to do that. But, but, but what, what the number tells us here is, it's not a lot, it's 3% of the Gulf of Maine. 3% heats every home and drives every car. So, so the other 97% could still be, be, uh, be business as usual okay, as we move forward. That's really why we did this exercise, is to, 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 to try to put a perspective as to what's needed to be harnessed offshore. Excellent, thanks. Um, uh, a sort of technical question here from Stephen about um, the nacelle versus the turbine itself. Maybe could you quickly just describe the different parts of the whole structure? And then he asks, does the nacelle rotate or does the entire hull rotate? Um, and sort of which pieces are moving here? Sure, sure, v very good question. But can you see where my, uh, where my cursor is? Or I can go, let me go, uh, to, yes. let yep. me go to a bigger, um, slide that would be easier to see. Uh, can you see um, my cursor? Yep. Okay. So uh, let's start Let's start from the top down. So you've, you've got the blades, right? And we all know the blades rotate, okay? And they rotate typically at 12 RPMs to 15 R revolutions per minute, essentially. That's what the blades do. Okay, so they rotate to generate electricity. Now, when, when the, when the, Let's go down to the very bottom. The bottom is you have the hull itself. The hull is moored, correct, to the seabed. So the hull can move around um, uh, in, a, in a certain watch circle, but can't go away forever because eventually uh, the, the mooring anchors, uh, the mooring lines would keep it on, on station. So the, the hull can move around in, in what we call in a watch circle and uh, not in a very big watch circle. You're talking 50 feet or so it moves around depending on how much wind there is and so forth. So, uh, so the, the hull will move. Um, now, but you can't rotate uh, very much either on its uh, along, around or around the vertical uh, or around the tower. So if you if you think about the the tower, if you hold on to the tower with your hand and turn it, okay, uh, uh, along, around the vertical axis, uh, the hull can actually move some. It's called the yaw motion, a little bit like that, but not a lot. Um, but what's really important is the turbine itself will point always point into the wind. So, so, so therefore, the, the, the rotor itself that you see here will rotate and always be pointing, facing the wind, okay? Uh, and, and, and that's called a yaw motion. So, so, so the turbine itself can yaw uh, about that axis. So does that answer the question? I think so. Thank you very much. Um, uh, another question here from George is, how deep would you expect a cable to be buried? Uh, it's a it's a very good question. And, if you know, and, that. yeah, I, I do actually. I'm gonna I'm gonna show you an example here. Um, um, so uh, th there's been a lot of uh, uh, we we've had undersea cables 
in the Gulf of Maine for decades. Uh, that, that's how we power the islands, in, in many islands in the, in the Gulf of Maine, Islesboro being one of them, for example. I'm gonna go to Islesboro. Uh, so Islesboro has a subsea cable from the west coast of Islesboro to, to Northport. Uh, and, and, um, and, and that cable um, was initially installed in 1955. Okay. So, and, then, and then back in 2015, they, they installed a new cable and they buried it uh, about six feet in the mud. Okay. So you want to try to bury it about six feet in the mud. In this case, they, they were able to find mud and they buried the majority of that cable as far as I know uh, at the time. Uh, that cable is owned by CMP, Central Maine Power and Powers Islesboro. So, 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 um, so there's a long history in Maine to power the islands like that. That's not the only cable we have. So, so our cable is no different. So to give you a difference here, uh, our cable uh, is gonna go from Monhegan to, uh, to Booth Bay. Uh, uh, what we, the goal here uh, is, is to try to bury it as well to the extent that you can. You can't bury it everywhere because we, there are some uh, rock outcrops closer to the surface sometimes. Uh, so the per one purpose of that survey you've been hearing about is try to figure out how much mud there is so you can bury the cable and minimize impact on the fisheries. Um, now, in terms of the size of the cable, uh, we, it hasn't been completely designed yet, but it'll be between six and eight inches in diameter, uh, the cable. And, and then the, the one that, we that was used for Islesboro, put in in 2015, is about four inches in diameter. So, so we're, we're going to go from four to six inches or four to eight inches in our case uh, for the cable. And I have one actually in my office, so I'm gonna hold it so you can see, see what it looks like. It's walking into the ocean back there. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna <laughs> go go to the ocean. <laughs> can you see the Can you see the cable? Yeah. Wow. That's it. That's the cable. Uh, huh. So, so it's not much different than, than the ones we've been burying in in the Gulf of Maine for decades. Okay, <laughs> to power the islands. I just want to make sure people understand that there's a lot of confusion. There's nothing new here in the cable technology uh, that's that's being used uh, in here. So, anyway, excellent. And and, uh, and I got another slide about the cable as well, uh, comparing uh, the Osborne cable and the Monhegan cable that, that's being proposed. So the Osborne is four inches, the Monhegan six to eight inches. Uh, the goal, um, uh, the 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 Osborne cable was thirty four five kb, the Monhegan six to six kb, and so on. Um, the goal is to bury them to the extent that you can. Wherever you can, you bury it. Whatever you can't, one, one, one option is to cover it uh, with concrete pads uh, to prevent, um, uh, uh, prevent it from being snagged, if you wish. Um, and typically, it's about a six foot deep trench uh, if you can bury it. Uh, so. and, uh, and the Osborne cable is buried about six feet, uh, but they stopped burying it when they got to a water depth of 10 feet, then they laid it down on the seabed. Thank All you right. very much. Does that answer the question? <laughs> uh, absolutely, I believe it does. Um, we have some uh, similar questions from uh, Barbara and Stephen here about sort of the other aspect, what happens when it gets to shore? Um, and I don't know if this a lot depends on where eventual um, uh, fields would be, but um, what happens when it connects to land? Would there be lots of infrastructure needed there or uh, what would that look like? Yeah, for, for a single turbine project, of course, it's a lot simpler, right? You, you got a very you know, single turbine. So the Monhegan project is a single turbine, single cable. And, and the goal here, um, uh, NIAV, New England Aquaventus, has a lot of QA on our website about, about the cable. And the, the, the goal was to bury it um, until you get to a substation, uh, bury it into, in, into, into the roadway uh, until you get to a substation. Um, and, and, uh, and there are a lot of buried cables like this already um, in different places in the, in the state of Maine. There's, not, there's nothing new there. So the goal is to bury it to the substation. That's where you plug it in, essentially. Uh, thanks. And there's a question about the potential for, uh, and this is maybe way down the line, but an offshore substation, is that something that uh, would be considered or when would that need to come into play? That, that's a possibility uh, in the future to have offshore substations. Of course, uh, the state of Maine is nowhere close to, to, uh, to thinking about yeah. those yet or, <laughs> or anything like that. We're, we're, you know, this is, you know, you're talking 20, maybe 20, 29, 2030, where we start thinking about these things. But, but, uh, but, uh, but there's a lot of time to do that. And there's, there are technologies being developed for floating substations as well. And, and just to, you know, our hull, um, as, as it sits right now, uh, is capable of, of holding up the, 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 the a floating substation in terms of its capacity. So, Great, thanks. Um, you mentioned 50-year storms, 500-year storms. Um, John asks, uh, how, 
sort of what's the high end of that consideration? He asks about a possible earthquake induced tsunami. Um, uh, what, can you talk a little bit about that? Sort of uh, how far, uh, what, what, what the yeah. largest size wave you can handle? Yeah, yeah. This, um, you know, um, uh, the, we, we're designing right now the, 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 the designs that we have are following guidelines put out by the, by the uh, uh, American Bureau of Shipping. So the American Bureau of Shipping has a guideline for building and classing floating offshore wind turbines. And part of that guideline, the first thing you need to do is figure out what environment you need to design it for. How much wind, how much waves, how much coincidence of winds and waves, what direction does the wind come from? What direction do the waves come from? Uh, and and uh, what kind of extreme waves you're gonna look at as well. Uh, whether you wanna look at, uh, uh, so breaking waves and other types of waves. So all of that is part of not only waves, but also icing conditions and, and snow and so on and so forth. So, uh, so all of that is part of the design criteria that we use. So what we use is we, we work with Medocean energy experts. That's what they do, uh, uh, Medocean condition experts. Um, and and that we have them on our project. And that's what they do for a living. They try to figure out what the biggest wave possible is. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what they, they spend their life studying and designing. And so we work with, with, with folks who develop these conditions for us. Then we plug these conditions into this guide. And, and then from that comes out 80, roughly 80,000 different load situations that we consider. So, so think about not just one or two or three load cases, 80,000 different ways that this thing can be hit by the winds or the waves and so on and so forth. And, and then that's how we design it to make sure it survives. So, so, so the question is an important question, but, it, but, uh, but there are, there are, there's a process if you wish that you go by to have safe structures out, out, out the environment. Do we know everything? Of course, we don't know everything. There, there, there can always be uh, a, a, um, a possibility for, um, for major storms to hit us here in the Gulf of Maine. And, and, and we actually, as part of our designs, we're, we're evaluating that. We're looking at the history of uh, 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 extreme storms in the Gulf of Maine, including, uh, including uh, uh, very unique storms that would come in and like we had in New Jersey and so on and so forth not mm -hmm. too long ago. And, and so we're studying these storms. Actually, we have statistical methods of predicting uh, what is the possibility of one of these storms and designing for those conditions as well. So. Excellent, thanks. Um, Quickly, I see a few questions in the chat about birds and how uh, and Monhegan's relationship to birds. I'm a birder myself, and I visit Monhegan frequently. It's one of my favorite spots on earth for birding. Um, we are going to dive into the topic of uh, birds and the Gulf of Maine next week um, with uh, really in-depth discussions about different bird populations in the Gulf, how they may be impacted, and then some of the technologies that may be available to um, help reduce or mitigate those impacts. So I encourage folks to stay tuned next week and you can register on our website um, for that presentation. Um, Dr. Dargar, a question from Nancy here about why the Monhegan site was chosen for um, this test turbine. There's a long history uh, about the Monhegan site selection. Um, again, it, it has, um, I'll, I'll go back and uh, explain. There's a number, there's pieces of legislation that was put together uh, to do test sites. That was the, uh, the beginning. Uh, so the governor's ocean energy task force in 2008 um, stated some energy goals for the state of Maine. Out of that task force work that uh, it spent over a year, um, they recommended creating test sites for, for testing new technologies because we can't go out there and build commercial farms without testing them first. So mm -hmm. it was a cautious approach. So, and, and, uh, and I was a lot younger at the day and I, and I sat with a lot of very smart people who wanted to, wanted to really plan this right. And so the, so the, the, so the task force uh, put together legislation, uh, put together uh, uh, recommendations, and LD 1465 uh, was established, which is uh, a legislation to create test sites. Okay, uh, and so the state of Maine went out there, actually surveyed the, uh, the populations up and down the coast, and including fishermen, and said, "Okay, where can we build these these units?" And and they uh, uh, they looked at a, uh, they started with ten sites, and eventually cut them down to three that were okay for people to use. Um, uh, and then one of them was Monhegan, uh, uh, that the state has actually developed as part of this uh, this, this this effort, and and the state, the University of Maine, uh, was assigned that to work on that site, and and and, and we've we've been busy since then, since two thousand and nine and ten, uh, to try to to try to get to this point. So it's been a long road. Uh, so. Excellent. So I see we are at 12.59. I, I see there are more questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to do one last question. 
um, from Chip here. Um, are you considering larger turbines to reduce the number of turbines? Or um, can you talk a little bit about the sort of scaling possibilities for um, the turbines themselves? That, that's a very, very good question, Nick. And I wish we had more time to talk about it. The answer is yes. What, what's happening with this industry, not only in Maine, but globally, turbines are getting bigger and bigger. And the reason for that is they get less expensive. Uh, if you have less turbines out there, you have less units to maintain, you have less units to deploy, you have less mooring lines, less anchors, less, less foundations, and so on and so forth. So, so the philosophy in the industry from an engineering perspective has been to go to larger units because you minimize costs and minimize impact. Um, and, and, and you could see um, when, we, when we first started the Monhegan project, our goal was to put two six megawatt units, okay? And, uh, and at the time, they were the biggest units that, that, that would possibly be available. And, and uh, today, here we are, uh, years later, and, and no, those six megawatt units aren't being made anymore. <laughs> so so, so <laughs> the, the same company that's making six megawatt units shut down their line, and they're making 12 megawatts. That's GE. They're making 12 megawatts plus right now, plus 13 and, and more. Um, just uh, just uh, over the last few weeks, uh, a 15 megawatt turbine was announced by one of the major OEMs as well. So, so yes, the answer is the industry is going to larger turbines and, 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 and we've already accounted for that in our design because we had two six megawatt units for money and, and now we're, we're, we're at a single 11 megawatt unit. So, so we went from two units to one unit already in Monhegan. So the effect of that has already taken place in our projects. Okay, those decisions have been made, yes. Okay, well, I wanna thank you, Dr. Dogger, so much for joining us today. Uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, thank yous and kudos in the chat. Um, so, and I want to echo those. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your work. And uh, we look forward to the future in the Gulf of Maine. Thank, thank you, Nick. Looking forward to work with all of you and, and the fishing industry and, and roll up our sleeves and figure out how to do it right. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have a good afternoon, thank everyone. Bye-bye.